Frenchie's Art Gallery, located on historic Oak Street beside the Maple Leaf Bar. With over 3,000 square feet of space, it features a large gallery front room and Frenchie's personal art studio. Frenchie's Art Gallery is also connected to the Maple Leaf Courtyard, which is ideal for the New Orleans night scene. Frenchie's Art Gallery, 8314 Oak Street. Yeah, you're right. So here's the bottom line. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I hope everybody out there is having a great summer, but does it get any better in the sporting world than what was going on this weekend? Hey, you know there's five major sports now that soccer has made a big come, back, come on with the hockey as well. And obviously we know football and baseball are one and two with basketball right there. But the NBA Finals and NHL Finals ended their season the last two nights. Last night, the NBA Championship. Hey, for the first time ever, Two teams matched up for three straight years. That's right. Golden State won two years ago. Cleveland won an epic seven-game series last year. And this year, it was Golden State again. They only really had one epic game, and that was game three when Golden State came from behind to go up 3-0 in the series. Cleveland won Friday, but Golden State came back and won last night on their home court. So they are the new champions. Congratulations to Kevin Durant for winning his first NBA title. I have a feeling he might have a couple more after this. NHL final, Stanley Cup. Finals with, with, with Sidney Crosby. The Pittsburgh Penguins won that on Sunday night against the Nashville Preds. Congrats to them. And how about the LSU Tigers? They are going to their 18th College World Series, looking for their seventh championship, and they're on a 16-game winning streak. They're going to throw Alex Lang in game one against Florida State, and he was a first-round pick last night. Hey, Greg Dykeman, the big-hitting right fielder, was a second-round pick, and my guests today are going to be great. I have my first Pulitzer Prize winner, Jeffrey Marks, he's going to talk about organ donation awareness and all the stuff he's written. And Johnny Arthur is a Tulane legend, De La Salle legend. Also, he played for the Milwaukee Bucks with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Lions yelling on LSU, Chase Mercado in the NBA draft and the NBA finals next on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Primetime Sports. I always love to hear from the Soul Brass Band. If you remember, that was my house band back in our other studio. Hey, but my next guest, I know you've seen his book because it's been on my set since the beginning when we moved to the new studio. It's called Walking with Tigers. It's with my two Saints books on our coffee table. But the author of that book is the youngest Pulitzer Prize winner ever for investigative reporting. And that was when he was 23 years old back in 1986. And here he is right on my set. His name is Jeff Marks. He is now part of the Baton Rouge community. He's from New York. He went to college in Chicago at Northwestern. And I knew him in Washington, D.C. literally 30 years ago. We played on some dangerous hoop teams. And I mean dangerous <laughs> with uh, Dave Stokes and Albie D. I had to throw Dave Stokes' name in there. Yeah. But how are you doing, Jeff Marks? Doing great. How are you? Jeffrey Marks, I should say a professional name, but guys like me that know you a while, I can call you Jeff, right? You can call me whatever you want. All right. Well, let's start, man. I mean, the, the whole thing with the Pulitzer Surprise, that's how I ended up meeting you years ago, because our it? mutual friend Merv Wampole is like, he knew my father was a writer. He's like, man, you got to meet my buddy. His name is Jeff Marks. And I'm like, and he said he has a Pulitzer Surprise, and I'm like, He's like 20-something years old. Tell me how this all came about. It's well, about the Kentucky basketball scandal. Right. First of all, that means it was a very long time ago, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, in my first job out of school, I was a newspaper reporter in Lexington, Kentucky. And this was a series of newspaper articles about cheating in college basketball, primarily at the University of Kentucky. But it was a long time ago. Hard for me to even remember a lot of the details. I see the Sports I Illustrated know. cover right there. 
Uh, that was that was actually a different. The Sports Illustrated piece was a little bit yeah, different. Right, right, yeah, right. Uh, but our series came out in 1985. Right. Uh, it was an incredible experience. Uh, something that I did not enjoy at the time at all. But you know, as an older man looking back on it, all you know, it feels a little bit different. And you've done so many things since then. But I want to ask. There was an article that you helped write for Gary McLean, uh, the guy who's the point guard for the Villanova basketball team. And to this day, I've said this before. I even knew you. This is my favorite Sports Illustrated article of all time. Obviously, that, that he was the point guard and the greatest upset to me in, in any sports history they, when they beat the heavily favored Georgetown Hoyas. But talk about how this came about. Well, that was in Lexington, Kentucky as well. It all started. <laughs> uh, the Final Four, it was the last time a Final Four was held in an arena that small, you know, right. a Rupp Arena. Now, of course, they go to these giant venues. But sure. this was a huge game, the matchup between Georgetown with Patrick Ewing and so many other stars and then little old Villanova. And, Gary McLean was the point guard for that team. I got to know him during the Final Four, and we stayed in contact. And lo and behold, he ended up in some uh, tough situations, and he wanted to share the story to help young people and asked me to help yeah, him. Yeah, for those it. that don't know, he, he admitted he did cocaine during the entire Final Four for the most part. But how did that even come up? That's, that's what I'm curious about. Well, I, I think it came up through trust. I mean, right. in terms of our conversations, uh, I never would have written anything about that uh, without... Sure, the friendship sure. developing and, and the conversations over a period of a couple of years. But he had gone into a rehab, and uh, when he came out, we started talking about that. And it's something he wanted to share with young people to help them, to help keep them away from the journey that he ended up on. Great writing there. Hey, Jeff will never admit this, but the one, one of the reasons that you check the box on organ donation awareness these days is through his work really starting almost 30 years ago with his sister, Wendy Marks. He has the Wendy Marks Foundation. And I'm going to let you take it from here because I never checked the box until I met you. Right. And since 1990, I have checked the box with every license to donate my organs because of your sister and your foundation. Well, Wendy was my little sister, my only sister, my best friend in this world. And that's a lot to have wrapped up in one person, especially when you're standing over her hospital bed uh, in 1989. And she was only 22 years old and she's in a coma and you're told that she has only 24 hours to live. And we were incredibly fortunate because her life was saved by a liver transplant. Her life was extended by 14 years. She ended up dying in 2003 as a 36-year-old woman. I miss her very much every day. She would be 50 last week, right? She, she, her 50th birthday was last week, wow. so we recognize that and honor her as well. We always do, and we keep telling her story to keep reaching people about the need for organ donors. We have such a horrible shortage in this nation. We need to keep thinking about that, talking about it, and hopefully checking off that box, but also going on the registries now and the internet registries all over the country now. And I'm going to continue this because I recently saw you at an event where you, you asked me to come down, and I did. It was after I taped the show, and everybody around New Orleans knows who little J.J. is. Obviously, right. he just, and this picture was taken literally three or four days before he got that liver transplant. It's with Drew Brees and you, and there's little J.J. at the bottom, and it was it takes lives to save lives, which Right. You know, I know you didn't start this foundation, but, you know, tell us that story with your relationship with J.J. and his father, Jordy. Right. Well, of course, everyone knows about Jarius and Jordy. They've been doing such great work to reach people, not only in Louisiana, but really throughout the world now with their message. And we got together last fall. We started working on some projects together because of our shared interest. And uh, just an amazing kid, you know, but magnetic charm, but also these medical challenges. And so many people were focused on the magnetic charm. I wanted to start focusing them more on getting this word out about organ donation. They've been doing a wonderful job, and we developed and produced his, his own football cards. Uh, one first Amazing, LSU. by the way, yes. I wish I had one to show you, because I have them in the car. But yeah, they're made, tell people about that. Yeah, well, we, first we did the LSU one, and then right. a month later, uh, the one in New Orleans with the Saints card. And it's really been wonderful. Even that goes back a lot of years, because the first card we did was with Mickey Mantle's family back in the 90s, and then okay. Carl Lewis, That's right. uh, we That's did right. his card. And then Wendy's. So JJ is actually, we never planned it this way, but over all those years, his cards are the fourth in an ongoing series, if you will, of these cards. All right, speaking of Carl Lewis, I know you had written books, or at least, I don't know how many at the time, but you had written at least one before the Wendy Marks Foundation mm -hmm. involvement with him. But tell, your relationship obviously got a lot closer, I imagine, because of the story you're about to tell. But let people know, because I know one thing. 
I was living in, in southern France for that summer, and the, the Olympics were going on in Barcelona. That would have been his fourth Olympics. Right. And y'all were staying at this compound of some sort. And you invited me over, and I ended up visiting for a while, and I probably stayed longer than I should have. Jeez, but, you have a lot better memory than I do, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that was a good time. <laughs> but my point, talk about this relationship with Carl and how it developed even stronger because right. he got involved with your sister's foundation. Well, it's always funny to me all these years later to look back on it. Everyone hears the name Carl Lewis and they think of this great athlete, which I understand that. Five Olympic teams, nine gold medals, the Olympian of the century. Think about that. Five Olympics. Until this guy named Michael Phelps came around, he was right. considered the greatest Olympian. Right, right. And you can make a lot of different arguments for different reasons for a number of people. But Carl was the Sports Illustrated and the International Olympic Committee uh, athlete of the century, Olympian of the century, and just a wonderful guy. But see, Everyone thinks of that first, running and jumping in stadiums throughout the world. For me, I see a guy, a friend, sleeping on the floor, literally sleeping on the floor of a hospital in San Francisco in 1989 while Wendy was in the coma because he wouldn't leave until we got a donor. And that, that was really the genesis of our work to promote organ donation. The Wendy Marks Foundation. Carl and Wendy and I did that together starting in 1990. And I'll never forget the day in 2003 when Carl and I were in the car riding home from Wendy's memorial service, unfortunately, in San Francisco. But we had a conversation then that this was work we would always continue in Wendy's name. Well, how is Carl doing these days? He's doing great. He's coaching. He's at the University of Houston. Yeah. Absolutely loves it. I never thought he was going to be a coach. And if he did coach, I thought it would have been of kids, younger kids, because that's what he's always enjoyed. But boy, he's coaching now, and he's one competitive guy, and they're doing absolutely great. They just won the Relay National Championship for University of Houston last weekend. Well, we rolled through about eight uh, covers of Sports Illustrated. He may have been on a ton more. I don't know. That's yeah. all I could find. But do you only hang out with people on the cover of Sports Illustrated? Because I have a few other guys <laughs> that you've become extremely close with Dale Brown. And I'm going to say this, through the dribbling with donors, or four donors. Right. Four donors. And I, you, I remember that. Was that the Georgetown game? It was a big... Oh, North this Carolina. was North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah, it was Super a big Dome. game, and I remember flying down. But explain that relationship and explain that game and how well, it got started. First of all, uh, you're starting to make me feel like we're writing my obituary here, like with all these <laughs> old things this going is, on. Just but, in case, <laughs> just in case, you're going to live to 120, but just in case. Well, Dale is a dear friend, and uh, he was part of our U.S. Sports Council on organ donation when it began. And as part of that, he invited us to Louisiana to do a game in the Superdome. It was in 1994. It was yeah. LSU against North Carolina, national TV game on CBS. Yes. Carl and Wendy were here, and uh, it was an amazing experience. We reached all kinds of people, handed out all kinds of material, raised all kinds of money, and it was a, really, for me, the benefit that came out of all that. You know, I always say that I have Dale to thank for my wife, and my wife has Dale to blame for me because <laughs> I met Leslie while I was here working on well, I was going to say this. You're a New Yorker, right? You right. go to school in Evanston, uh, Chicago, basically. Right, yeah. You live in D.C. That's how I got to. And you were there for quite a while. You I had was. roots there. Yeah. And then you all of a sudden come to Louisiana and live here permanently. Right. And I kind of had to do a double take the first time I saw you in the press box because I hadn't seen you in a while. I did a double take, too. <laughs> Number one, I, I did a triple take. I was like, I wasn't well, that's because sure I gained I all this weight. Why you... That's you're like, wow, do I know you? <laughs> but uh, my point is, is like, what do you think of Louisiana and what made you stay here? Well, I love it. It's my adopted homeland. I had the good fortune of meeting Leslie, a beautiful lady from Thibodeau, Louisiana. you got to give that plug in. Get it in. Always, always. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I'm here. So I've been here 10 years, coming up on 11 now. And it's been wonderful. I love it. Uh, the experience has been amazing. I'm not sure I would have wanted to be here when I was young and single, but being old and married, it's been fantastic. And uh, I'm a Louisiana guy. I get teased about it all the time. My friends up in New York think I'm crazy. Oh, yeah. Chicago, oh, yeah, I can only imagine. Where I, you know, <laughs> right. But I love it. And every time they come down and visit, they love it, too. It's been, it's been wonderful. Another guy that I, this is another crazy story because this is earlier in your life. You had some connection with the Baltimore Colts, and one of right. the quarterback at the time is a legend from here. By the way, if you, those of you who don't know, Burt Jones, you see in that Sports Illustrated, you had another friend of his on Sports Illustrated. The 1976 NFL MVP, people forget that. At LSU, he was a part-time quarterback, which right. is the craziest story of all. But he's a great, great guy. Uh, what's the relationship? How'd that go? Well, as an 11-year-old boy, I became a ball boy for the Baltimore Colts. How and crazy I, is that? I, it was an amazing experience. I did it 
all through my college. Uh, as in, as a New Yorker, college. how'd you get to Baltimore? I'm curious. I was just a little kid, a sports loving kid at a camp spending the summer in Baltimore. And little did I know when I went down there that the Baltimore Colts training camp happened to be on the same grounds. And oh, I wow. got to know wow. these guys. Burt Jones was one of the first to this day. He and his family, I'm very close with it. Tony Fritch, is that ringing a bell? Is that, is that the Tony guy? Tony Linhart, Linhart was Linhart. the kicker. Exactly. That's the guy. Weren't you close to Both him? Both Austrians, right? Tony was a dear friend as well. Lost him a few years ago, unfortunately. But uh, you know, those experiences, and Burt Jones was the first person I ever met, remember, a little kid from New York, the first person I ever met from the state of Louisiana, and what an ambassador he's been through all these years. Amazing, right? As a, as a guy that at this point I'd known you for at least two years, and, and when you started writing for this new paper called The National, mm -hmm. and for those of you sports fiends that are at least 50-ish, you know that's the great Frank DeFord, who just passed away a couple weeks ago. Right. The National hired the very best writers uh, of sports and all kinds, and they had a daily newspaper, which I read every single day. I used to get that paper at the East Mark Village on East Capitol in D.C. Yeah. and read it every day. But talk about Frank and your experiences working with him. Well, uh, I miss Frank already. Uh, he's been gone such a short time, but he was an absolutely incredible man. He was one of, one of the two men who I would say were my main mentors in my career. And uh, Frank was unbelievably talented. I mean, everyone knows that, that follows sports. But what a lot of people don't know is the type of human being he was. I was so fortunate to have him take me in. And uh, I learned so much from him, not only about being a journalist and being a writer, but just about grace and about dignity and about the way he handled himself. Uh, this man was absolutely amazing. He, he was so talented and yet so humble so enjoyable to be around, so open and so giving to so many people in so many different ways. I love the man. What you can't see over your shoulder, are we showing, that's why I keep looking at tons of great shots okay. and images of everybody you're talking about, particularly Frank DeFord, because even great writers such as yourself say, when, uh, when I think I'm a great writer and I read Frank DeFord, I realize I can't write at all. Oh, right? well, right. It, it always does two things. Anything I, anytime I read stuff that Frank wrote, and I did it again just a couple of days ago, I was thinking about him. and. It does exactly that. Number one, it inspires me to write. And number two, it reminds me that I'm really not much of a writer and maybe I ought to try something else. You're one of the best I've ever known. Hey, real quick, last thing. Brandon Landry has been very, very big, good to you. Yes. Uh, I'm giving him a plug only because all your book signings and events like the charity stuff, he has opened up walk-ons to you. Talk right. about what that means to you. Well, my friendship with Brandon and the relationship with walk-ons has been wonderful. They were the sponsor of my statewide book tour with Walking with Tigers a couple years ago. Uh, also had a program to donate books to schools all over the state of Louisiana. So their commitment to things that they do for the community, for the whole state, and now for the region has been remarkable. And that's an ongoing relationship, and I hope it keeps going and growing. Wonderful guy. Great company. Well, your waistline might grow after this restaurant visit <laughs> because that is one of my favorites in okay. town. I want you to enjoy that with your beautiful wife. Thank you. The girl from Thibodeau. Thank and you. enjoy that and uh, bring her down to New Orleans. I know you're up in Baton Rouge, but hey, there's Dale Brown. All right. Well, you know, since you're close with Dale, why don't you give me one of those right near him, somewhere in that vicinity. All right. Jeff Marks, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's the first one I've ever had, and I'm very pleased to call him a friend, and I have for a long time. Hey, coming up next, we're going to talk some NBA draft, but don't forget, I know you're waiting for your LSU stuff. I've got Lions yelling. Chris Blair was supposed to be down here. He's got to get on to Omaha, though. So Lions yelling is going to pinch it. He's been with them intimately for the last six weeks. So I have no, no qualms about him knowing everything about that team. And don't forget, at the end of the show, I've got Johnny Authors. That's right. He averaged 26 points a game for the Tulane Green Wave. His senior season, he ended up playing a little bit with the Milwaukee Bucks with a guy named Lou Alcindor. All that coming up next on Primetime Sports. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. I fake jaked you because we're going to take Lion Jell and we're going to talk LSU baseball now. We're going to get to Chase in the NBA draft in a little bit and, of course, Johnny Authors. But, hey, Lion Jell has been my most frequent guest. He is my Joan Rivers of the Tonight Show on this show right here. 
And little did I know he was coming as Don Johnson again. Welcome there we go. Don Johnson. Miami Vice, everybody. Try to keep it cool Look at for the summertime. Guy. Look at him looking <laughs> sharp. You're looking good, man. Thank you. You have been immersed in this LSU Tiger baseball team. And I use uh, that as a quote you used for yeah. the last six weeks. What are your first uh, takeaways from this ball club from when you started watching them and the, the heat that they've caught? Because they have now won, what, 18 games in a row? They've won 16, 16 in, a row. Games in a row. They've won 21 of 23. I mean, this is the hottest team in baseball, in college baseball right now. And being here, getting to talk to you about them is like dessert for me. This, is, th this has been fun to watch as this team has progressed throughout the season. Because, you know, you look at some of the midweek games, they tried to, to experiment with a few things, but... This team has absolutely caught fire from top to bottom of the lineup. They can absolutely crush you from a million different directions. The pitching has been phenomenal. Uh, even the other night, you watch Poche struggle, and Gilbert comes in and was terrific. So not only do they have strong starting pitching, but they got great middle relief. They got a four starter possibly in the back of the bullpen with Hess and Newman is, is outstanding. Uh, Andy Canizero called them the most dynamic team in the country. Right now, they absolutely are. Well, Hess came up big. I mean, that game, let's start, let's start there because Mississippi State comes in. Everybody's like, it's hard to beat a team five times. You just swept <laughs> them. And Andy Canizero's team was extremely hot. And then he comes in and, and LSU's down 3 nothing in the eighth inning. It looked like it was just a more fun performance. And all of a sudden, you were there. They caught fire. Tell people it was like, because if they lose that first game, you never know how it's going to sure. go. But it looked like they were going to lose, and that eighth inning was sp something special. Kramer Robertson and Greg Dykeman talked to the team in the bullpen before that eighth inning, and they said, guys, we got to stop pressing. We're, we're not as good when we, when we try to press. They were tight, and it's understandable, but they calmed things down. And that walk in the eighth inning to Kramer Robertson where he started, where he was just overtly emotional and, and was trying to get the crowd pumped up and the, and the dugout pumped up, that changed the whole complexion of the game. They were loose after that, and, and you saw what happens. Four runs in that eighth inning. Zach Hess comes in and closes it out. But that was a turning point in that series, and, and Mississippi State was just deflated after that. Well, Dykeman hit that big two-run double. That was giant. That's when you felt, okay, right. we, they have a chance. He had been 2, two of 14 before right, that, so right. he was really struggling at that point. Well, and we saw a picture of Josh Smith, the freshman. He had hit a, a shot we thought was going to be a three-run homer to put them up 3-2 right. at the time because they were down 2 nothing, and he didn't get it. But Dykeman ended up coming through, and, of course, Zach Watson has been coming through literally ever since the middle of May. And this guy's been one of the hottest players in America. Unbelievable. I mean, the freshman changes his approach at the plate just before the regional starts using two hands on the bat. They were kind of his teammates were making fun of him, calling him Ken Griffey Jr. Because he would release his one hand off the bat before he even made contact with the ball. So made some swing changes and you saw four home runs in two days in the regionals. He hit four home runs in 60 games before that. But it's just been clutch hit after clutch hit. Nothing seems to get to these freshmen. And, and they've got a great mix of Nice veterans. shot of my godson, uh, Rankin Woolley, right there. Makes the he last got, out. He got the last out. Yeah. I know. I'm so happy for him. Hey, but look, the, the devastation of the start of this lineup. I mean, I'm telling you, when you can throw a Robertson, a Freeman, and a Duplantis, and Dykeman, and then obviously the emergence of Zach Watson, and then you got Jordan, those guys behind, and papirsky has been hot. This lineup has become pretty devastating. It is. And then you've got now you've got Slaughter starting at first. Coombs on the bench. He can come in. I mean, you, you just have this team can hit you in so many different directions. And it doesn't require everyone to be on at the same time. They, the, the top of the order might be hot. The bottom of the order might be hot. Some guys in the middle. I mean, they just they're so deep. And it's such a complete team that now, on top of that, just believes in itself like no other in the country. I mean, this momentum they have is, is pretty impressive, and you can just see the confidence just, just flowing out of them. I think one of the things we have to ask, though, because we've had two subpar performances by the great Poche. Uh, obviously, you know, he's been going for the record, right. and he, he hasn't come up. Now, what do you think it's going to happen in the World College World Series? Because you got a guy named Eric Walker who's been pitching very well. He came and got the big win, the third win against Rice. Uh, I guess in the regional, and then he got the big win in the SEC tournament against Arkansas. You got Lang on day one. We know that. Sure. But who do they throw day two? Is it Eric Walker or I think is it going to be I think, Poche? I think they stick with Poche. I mean, look, I, I think it's difficult. These guys, these hitters that they've been playing, they've been playing SEC teams a lot, and they've seen Poche before. Mississippi State has seen Poche a number of times, uh, so they know him well. I think once they go to the World Series, he hasn't had to pitch much lately. 
because he hasn't pitched well, maybe he's a little rested. The, you're not at home going for the record. So maybe the pressure lessens just a little bit. So I, I think Poche will be okay. And, and Eric Walker, I mean, having him, having him there to be your third pitcher is, is just – Phenomenal because that kid pitches with great pace. He, nothing. Ice the water, never ice too water is in his veins. Ice water is in his veins. He is not an 18. He does not pitch like an 18 year old. He's phenomenal. Hey, uh, Florida State, this is their 22nd World Series. Yeah. I used to produce ACC baseball games, so I know Mike Martin well. <laughs> he is a legend, but he has never won the College World Series. That's LSU's first opponent, Florida State. Um, do you have a scout report? Because LSU, well, this will be their 18th World Series, and they're going for their seventh championship. This, this is no, this is no easy start for LSU. I mean, Florida State had some troubles in the middle of the season, but remember, this is a team that began ranked third in the country. They eventually moved up to number one. Had some tough uh, stretch in the Struggle middle. Struggle like LSU did for a after, while. Right? After a series loss to Wake Forest, they've since won 12 of 13. So this is a hot team too. So it's one of those things, you know, ACC, SEC, the matchups. These teams don't know each other well. Anything can happen in the College World Series. So uh, I think LSU has a little more, minimum, little more momentum than Florida State and, and is a more complete team. But, but anything can happen in Omaha. They'll play the primetime game Saturday night. I cannot wait. Primetime prime Saturday time. night. Prime time! Hey, that's the name of the show. I think it's called I, Prime Time. I, I thought about that. I, I figured you did. Hey, real quick, I have to ask you about the dynamic between Andy Cannizzaro. It was much talk about this. Uh, I was texting him the entire week, and he was like, I'm ready. Go get him. He's fired up. <laughs> and no, a lot of times people might take a while to return a text. Every time I send him one, it was within seconds. He's like, I can't wait. Well, uh, he had to be riding high with the 3-0 lead in the eighth in the first sure. game behind Connor Pilkington, who was phenomenal as pitcher. But a lot was made of this, this whole situation with Maneri. Obviously, Canizero a coach for him. He left under some circumstances that everybody's got their own kind of story about, but less than ideal, correct? And, sure. And there was, regardless of what they're going to say, there was some tension amongst them. So what did, what did you see being there with both coaches? Well, there, there was definitely tension. I mean, the quick handshake. The, the guys did not want to talk to each other. I thought Andy Canizero kind of was – poking at Maneri all week long. I mean, the tweets and, and just talking, gushing about the LSU program. He was clearly trying to get in the head of the LSU players and coaches. And, and, and I think at first it, it worked and, and you saw LSU. LSU was tight and, and they had been and talking about how great they were and, and great they are. And Mississippi State had just been, been blowing them up all week long. And, and, and I think that took a toll early on in the game. But, but Andy Canizero got the win before the series for his mental games with LSU. LSU got the win in the end. But their relationships are close. There you see them at coaching together at LSU. They yeah. were close. And it's interesting because when I had Benary on before, and I don't mind saying this, I didn't know anything. This was back in February when nobody was really knowing anything. He said, do me one favor. Don't bring up Andy Canizero. <laughs> and that's when I first got an inkling, oh, wow, there's something there. But it really, it didn't get picked up on for a couple months later. Yeah, look, I, I don't think Paul Maneri likes the way he, he exited the program and, and kind of it was in the dark of night, went to Mississippi State. I think there's some bad blood there. You would, you would hope they could move on. But, you know, hey, they gave him a shot. Andy Canizero took advantage of it. You know, he should be very thankful to Paul Maneri because, you know, two years ago, He's the reason, uh, Paul Maneri is the reason that Andy, Andy Canizero is now at Mississippi State and, and succeeding. He's going to get a $55 million stadium renovation. So he's, he, he's on the cusp of doing something pretty good over so there. Johnny Carson, you're Joan Rivers, to David Letterman, you're Terry Garr, but to Saturday Night Live, you are Tom Hanks and Alec Baldwin, the biggest, most, uh, <laughs> the most times a guest has ever been on this show. So you probably have a dozen of these oh, things. I don't think you've been you. on a dozen times. But you've been on several. You might go to I've, clean I've up never been every called time. Joan Rivers or Terry Gar either, but <laughs> most people okay. don't know Terry Gar. <laughs> she was a frequent guest on the Letterman Show in the early days. Lion Jell, appreciate him. Check him out on WWL. He, along with Leslie Spoon and, of course, Doug Mouton, they have a great team over there. Hey, coming up next, I'm not positive who they're going to bring to me next, but I know I have Johnny Arthurs and Chase Bricado. Stay tuned on Primetime Sports. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my hey, oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. All night, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll. 
The owners of the Delachay's Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachay, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachay, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Vojkovic family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. Hey, don't forget Johnny Arthurs. He played for De La Salle. He was a legend there. He was a legend at Tulane, and he played in the NBA for the Milwaukee Bucks with a guy named Lou Alcindor, but that's coming up next. Right now, hey, you remember the NBA draft? We just had Del Demps on last week. Well, the draft is in nine days. The, the Pelicans gave away their first-round pick to get Boogie Cousins, but they do have a pretty good second-round pick in a deep draft at number 40. We're going to talk to our draft expert. He was on last year talking NBA. His name is Chase Picado. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Really looking forward to this. Always, dude. You've been great. This is your third time. Actually, you're one of only four people that's been on at least three times, so congratulations to that. He is the University of Alabama grad. He loves football but knows his hoops, so we're going to jump right into it. Let's start with what happened last night. The NBA Finals ended. I know basketball guys like me just want to see more basketball, but I did call Golden State in five, so I have that one. But I was rooting for Cleveland last night anyway because I wanted to see seven games. Break this down. What did you think of the NBA Finals as a whole? Yeah, Scott, last night's game, it really showed you that Kevin Durant, he might be taking the torch as the next greatest player in the NBA from LeBron James. You saw it, the way that LeBron, he was trying to cover Durant one-on-one. -on -one. He was just too tired. He had to do everything for his team, where Durant, he has four other All-Stars, so if he didn't have the game he needed to, you have Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, it's a little bit of a different feel, but I'm really happy for the guy because he did what he had to do, and he really wanted to bring a championship to Oakland after what happened last year, and he went out and did it. Well, what, are you in the camp that says, because there's a lot of people out there, uh, I had a bunch of 19-year-old uh, kids watching the game at my house last night, my son's friends, and they were in the camp that they didn't like the way he went about and did it. Uh, and I told them, no one's going to remember that in a couple years. Uh, because, listen, LeBron, everybody was down, down on LeBron. And all of a sudden, you know, he didn't win his first year with the Miami Heat when he took off. And he ended up winning the second year. And he won his third year. And they lost the next one. But the fact is, is that I think people have forgotten about that and embraced LeBron. Will they do the same for Kevin Durant? I think they will, Scott. And the reason why is because he did win finals MVP. It's not like Steph Curry carried Kevin Durant to this championship. Kevin Durant, you can make a point that carried Steph Curry in this team. Without Durant on this squad, they might not beat the Cleveland Cavaliers. So I think what Durant did, averaging over 30 a game in the finals, he had the second most points in five games in NBA Finals history. I mean, there's not much you can say. He was perfect. I love the way you said that. He was the finals MVP. He wasn't riding coattails. He did join a team that had won 73 games the year before. Where does LeBron stand now? Now he's in eight, eight finals he's been in, and he's only won three. I say only. That is a great accomplishment. LeBron is in the pantheon of great players in NBA history. But where are you, as a younger guy than me, would put, put LeBron? Are you putting him in Michael Jordan territory, or do you think he has a little bit yet to go? I think I am putting him in MJ's territory, Scott. And the reason why is because when he's facing elimination, he shows up. Last night, 41 points. He averaged a triple-double this finals. First time it's happened in NBA history. It's phenomenal. But what would you say to people that say he is still 10 games under 500 in NBA finals games? The one thing I would say to them is look up the teams they played. He's actually only been favored twice in the eight finals he's been in. And he's won three. That is why I have him on. He's bringing some game. I had no idea about that stat, and I usually know him. I like it. All right, let's get to this draft because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, the top of the draft is, is special to me. you got a lot of freshmen that are going to be, I think, potential NBA superstars. Boston gets the first pick because they get it from, 
from the, from the Brooklyn Nets. And how, how great is this? You go to the conference finals against the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you get the first pick. Kind of reminds me of the days when they picked up uh, Larry Bird and the Lakers picked up uh, Magic Johnson. Here's the big question. Everybody thinks they're going to take Markel Fultz. I mean, there's a guy named Lonzo Ball. There you, you see him already in a Boston uniform right there. Uh, Markel Fultz is from Washington, D.C., but he went to the University of Washington across the country. His team only won nine games. First of all, tell me how good you think Fultz is going to be. And secondly, do you think he's going to be a Boston Celtic? I think Fultz is going to be a superstar. I really do. He reminds me of Russell Westbrook, but a better offensive game coming out of college. I agree. I agree. And the, But I'm going to throw a wrench into this. I think that Boston actually is not going to take Fultz. I think that they're going to make a trade with the Chicago Bulls and give the front office. What? You got a wrench. He's coming out. Oh my goodness. Okay, what what is this insider trade you got I, I, working? No, I just I've been I just have a feeling that the Boston Celtics realized this year that bringing in Fultz, that's not going to beat the Cleveland Cavaliers. Not this year. Not next year. Not in three years. What's going to beat Cleveland and LeBron James is you need to bring in a wing defender that can lock you yeah, down. Yeah, they have no one that can guard LeBron right now. Exactly. Great. And so who Jimmy did, Jimmy Butler, I think, can guard LeBron James and make it a lot more difficult and take the pressure off Isaiah Thomas. You saw in that in that conference finals, he just got gassed. I mean, he had to do everything for the Celtics. They had no answer for LeBron. In Bulls, they've said Jimmy Butler is not happy with the situation Chicago is putting him in. So why not, if you're Chicago, get a few assets for now. You can get the best play in the draft, and then you ship that $18 million salary to Boston. So that's a win-win. What would it take, though, for Boston to pry Jimmy Butler, who is a marquee player? I, I have to say he's a top 10 to 15 player in the league away from the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, I think you're going to have to give the first pick, obviously, overall this year a middle second rounder, and then two future first that they still have from the Brooklyn wow, Nets. Wow, wow. You're going to give that much up? I think so. because You're going to give that much up because those Brooklyn Nets picks are very good. You don't think it would take just two and maybe a second? or I just think the window that the Boston Celtics have right wow. now with Isaiah Thomas, he's in the prime of his career. Right now, you have to get Cleveland. If you want to make it out of the Eastern Conference, you have to go through Cleveland, and I think Jimmy Butler is the answer. Offensively and defensive, Jimmy Butler superior to what they have. And the fact is, as great as Isaiah Thomas is, and he's the best fourth quarter scorer we have in the league, he is not very good on defense. So they need help in that sense too, so he can help them out there. All right, the second pick belongs to a team called Los Angeles Lakers. Oh, Boston, L.A., the most storied franchises in NBA history get the best two picks. Um, Lonzo Ball happens to play at a school right down the street called UCLA, and there you see him with his father. He's become famous, LeVar Ball. Uh, BBB stands for? Big Baller Brand. Big Baller Brand. He's already out there. Is this guy too much of a detriment for the Lakers to take, or meaning, meaning the dad? Or do you think they go ahead and take Lonzo Ball? Or do they have another surprise up their sleeve on that second pick? Honestly, Scott, I think it's a no-brainer that you take Ball just because the Lakers, they're showtime. It's all about box office. People go to the game sometimes as a social event. And I think you bring in that type of personality. I know it's a little bit off the wall. But it's what Lakers fans like. They like these kind of players. They like being hyped up, getting a homegrown kid out of UCLA. I think it just makes too much sense. But De'Aaron Fox is someone that the Lakers have their eye on and they really like. And what he did to Lonzo Ball in that Elite Eight game, that really makes a big mark. Yeah, that game, you're looking right there at that picture. Fox was the best player on the court. They had a guy named Malik Monk on his team who's going to be a high pick, Lonzo Ball. But it was Fox that ripped up the UCLA Bruins. Why is this guy special? This guy can do it all, Scott. He's very athletic. He can drive the paint on anyone. He's not scared of anybody. He's not as big as Lonzo 6'4", or Lonzo 6'6", for a point guard, but he can shoot. He, it showed you in that game, he doesn't need other players to be playing well for him to show up. He pretty much put Kentucky on his back. Hey, uh, let's talk about the top-heavy part of this draft because we just mentioned three fantastic players, but there's a few others, and I want to get your opinion on Fox's teammate Malik Monk, uh, who was one of the, the most electric players I've seen. I mean, some of these dunks were outrageous, but he's also just equally as good of a three-point shooter. Kansas has a guy named Josh Jackson, and Duke has a guy named Jason Tatum. Tell me what you think about these three guys in particular, because next week I'm going to bring you back, and we're going to talk more about the Pelicans themselves and what they might need. But as far as these three guys at the top of this draft, how good are they and who's going to take them? 
Yeah, I really like uh, Malik Monk. I think he's a sniper. You put him on a team that can spread the floor. He shoots 40% from three and come in right away and give you instant offense. But the guy that you talked about out of those three, I think Jason Tatum has the most superstar potential out of those three. Out of Duke. I love Jason Tatum, man. He is unbelievable. And Why I, do you like him? I just think he's a Carmelo Anthony type. He, uh, he shots uh, 17 points per game this year, 50% from the field. So he's very efficient in his shooting, and he's just someone that can get hot really quick. You saw it at the end of the season for Duke. He pretty much put Duke on his shoulders. I'm a huge Jason Tatum fan. And by the way, we've talked about Markel Fultz, Lonzo Ball, De'Aaron Fox, Malik Monk, and Jason Tatum. But when I had my basketball analyst, f- former Final Four coach John Brady on, the guy that he likes the most, and he is a Final Four coach, so I'm going to give him some creeds, was a guy named Josh Jackson out of Kansas. What do you think about Josh? Yeah, I like Josh. He reminds me of Andrew Wiggins when he was at Kansas. He kind of was just a really athletic. He, he's kind of raw on offense, but yeah. he'll get a lot better like Andrew Wiggins now, averaging 20 points a game. Right. First came in a little bit raw, but that's with coaching. But he's someone that's very athletic, and it looks like his game translates well to the NBA. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring you back uh, next week, and we're going to talk. Uh, it's going to be a brief segment where we're going to talk about the Pelicans. Uh, they, they have the 40th pick, what they might do there, and maybe talk about a quickly brief free agency, and also maybe some sleepers. But Chase Mercado, we're going to bring it back next week right here on Primetime Sports. But coming up next, I have Johnny Arthurs. That's right. He is a two-way legend, De La Salle legend, NBA player, and all-around great guy right here on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. say I saved the best for last, but when it comes to athletic ability and, and accolades, I saved the best for last in this one because my guest, next guest is a two-lane legend, a De La Salle legend, and he played for the Milwaukee Bucks in the National Basketball Association. His name around two-lane circles is well known. There's only three men's jerseys retired, and I've got one of them sitting next to me. His name is Johnny Arthurs. He averaged 16 points as a sophomore. Freshman couldn't play back then. He averaged 20 points as a junior and 26 points as a senior. He was one of the leading scorers in the nation. That's right, and he's sitting right here. Welcome to the show, and he's a gentleman. I've gotten to know you over the last five years. Uh, you were a, a De La Salle legend. I'd heard your names through the halls, uh, you know. And actually, Gron Bercato, who is your friend, put out a list, and I've done my research, put out a list of the top 100 players in New Orleans basketball history. And he did this about seven years ago. And they had 13 De La Salle players on that list out of the 100. And that's out of all the schools in New Orleans. There's a ton. And Johnny Authors was ranked 16th on that list of the greats. Uh, and then, by the way, his coach was number one of all time in New Orleans history. Of course, the great John Altabello. I did my research, and I asked a bunch more people. Uh, they say Johnny Arthur should have been a lot higher than 16. <laughs> None of them put you outside the top 10. And welcome to my show. It's been a long time coming. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, let's start with the Tulane stuff because I know Tulane fans love you, uh, you know, especially the ones that remember you playing. But you're at every game, and I love that about you. But you got there in 65, right? Mm-hmm. And they didn't let freshmen play. But... You, when you when you finally got to play, they had just left the SEC, I guess, your freshman year. So Tulane, by the way, people don't know this, they were an independent for 10 years before joining the Metro Conference in the mid-70s. But you would have been all-conference of all conferences every year you played. But talk about your time at Tulane, particularly in the beginning. Well, in the beginning, uh, of course, coming out of De La Salle, I was recruited by Coach Ralph Peterson. Yeah. And uh, we came in with seven freshmen who right. have remained friends Lifelong friends. Since really? We all came in. Six of us graduated. We got our degrees. But on the freshman team, we were one of the best freshman team in the country. And that's the reason we got to play UCLA four years later. Oh, wow. Because Al Sinder was at UCLA. And uh, when we were noted as one of the better teams, we eventually were able to schedule them and got to play them. Well, Lou Al of course, became 
the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Most people say that's that's you as a freshman. You were number 53 then on the. See, they had freshman team. I have to explain to my younger audience. They had freshman team. Pistol Pete Maravich played against uh, Tulane a lot. They used to play a couple times a year, but he couldn't play as a freshman. He scored. The most points in NCAA history, and he only did it in three years. But, Johnny, your senior year, you guys had some battles with Pistol. Uh, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated, which I love. And it's not because of you, but you happen to be in the picture with Pistol Pete Maravich. That's you on the, the, bottom, the top right, and that's you putting your booty into him a little bit, right? And that's yeah. Billy Fitzmorris, the great coach at, at Newman for many years. Uh, talk about playing against Pistol. You averaged 26, so you're no slouch. He happened to average 44, uh, which is, you know, the best of all time. But talk about those memories. Well, I'll tell you this. The, um, this is a coincidental thing. My coach, Ralph Peterson, passed away a couple of months ago. Oh, wow. His son sent me some memorabilia, and one of them is the stat sheet from our senior year game against Pete, the second time we played in February of 1969. Pete got 66. I love this headline, by the way. Time speaking oh, in. Yeah, yeah. Wave hosting Mavericks is a picture of you and Pistol. Does it get any better than that? <laughs> Tulane LSU record setters, meaning they're talking about you against mm -hmm. Pistol. That's amazing. Go ahead. Right. But anyway, on the stat sheet, I had forgotten this. Pete took 51 shots, and he made 25. So he ended up with 66 points as a team no one took more than five shots of his teammates. Nobody. That game. No one. So Pete had 51 shots, made 25, probably made 14 or so free throws. So he ended up with 66, set the all-time record. The good news for us is we won by 14. How about that? I mean, seriously, how about that? I know LSU wasn't bad. They just didn't go to the NCAA tournament. Back then, it wasn't like now how many teams get in. Right. But the fact is you beat the pistol by 14. I mean, this guy, when I grew up, which was the mid-70s, and that's when the Jazz came in town from 74 to 79, I got to tell you, he was my idol. And to this day, when people say, who's your all-time favorite of anything, Pistol, what was that like, the whole experience? of? Because it had to be kind of a rock show whenever he came to town. Well, gr great segue. Uh, first time we played them at the Kyle Palace. Up in Baton Rouge. I was a junior. It was Pete's first game against Tulane as a sophomore in Baton Rouge. And we're warming up. And as you know, you don't watch your opponents. You don't look at your opponents while you're warming up. You just keep warming up. Well, they come out and they start playing Sweet Georgia Brown. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. So I'm thinking, that's, Harlem a, that's Globe the Globetrotter song. Right, right. I love it. So we're, we're taking peeks and we're sneaking look at it. And we see, and Pete's at the foul line. And they're lined up in two rows shooting layups. And he's spinning the ball and hitting it to one guy. He's throwing it behind his back. All to sweet Georgia Brown. Oh my god. So goodness. we're just, you know, we're looking at Pete like this, watching it. So that's a lot of That's stuff. how we were indoctrinated to Pete. I will say this, we had four great games. He never scored less than fifty. Um, I don't think maybe I didn't score less than twenty, let's say, for that, you know, that's the relativity of Pete and I as far as points. But we uh, we did have some good games and I uh, enjoyed playing against him every time. What are your fondest college memories though? I mean you had a great career, like I said, I mean you, you elevated your point totals uh, uh, by a great margin each year you played. But what are your finest years? There's Harold Sylvester, the great yeah. player out of St. Aug, obviously Billy Fitzgerald, and then yourself on the right. I mean, you had some good teams and some great teammates. We did. We had some great teams. And I will tell you this, although we had some great games with LSU, if you ask the senior group that I came in with what was their memorable game, it would be UCLA in Pauley Pavilion our senior year. I mean, they had won so many national championships already, and they even won five more after that. But what was that like? Well, and I'm, I'm glad you put Harold up. I'm going to tell you a quick little anecdote. <clears throat> when we played UCLA, I believe they'd won 62 in a row. So we were a little intimidated, to say the least, sure. to try to break it up. So we go out to, to midcourt to opening tip, and Harold stayed in there looking at Alcindor's numbers. You know, Alcindor Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Right. Right. And Harold looks around Lou and he says, coming to you, Johnny, on the tip. You know, and Lou looks down at him like. <laughs> that is a good story. So, uh, like, it's Kareem seven foot two. Right. So <laughs> he's like. As fate would have it, the ball's deflected. I get it. I go down and take about a 16 foot jumper and we lead two nothing. So you had the lead. We're up two zip. Right. And I'm running back court and my, one of my friends, Terry Habig, who's an orthopedic surgeon here in New Great Orleans. Great doctor. Absolutely. Is standing at half court backpedaling and he says, we got him, Johnny. We got we him. We got him. <laughs> You guys were fun. <laughs> well, we had a ball. So we you didn't have him really, did you? No, we did not. <laughs> uh, Coach Peterson called timeout at 14-2 after they had scored 14 straight. Well, that team uh, later ended up winning 88 games in a row, a different club. But, I mean, that, that was just it. They, how many? 9, 10, 11 national uh, championships. Yeah, yeah. They had a run with John Wooden. But 
Talk about De La Salle because you played for the great John Altabello, and I'd be remiss not to bring this up because he was considered the greatest coach in New Orleans history. That's not me saying it. That's, that's people that are a lot more historian-like than me in this, this realm. But you played at De La Salle. You guys were great for many, many years. What was that experience like? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's going to take you back a little further okay. to Nord Ball, Nord Recreation Department. I, we all my, played it. My coach at Nord there was, it is right was there. a fellow named Ronnie Oakland. Ronnie played for Johnny Altabello. Okay. So from eight years on, I was indoctrinated basically to the system of Mr. A Mr. Altabello. He was not Coach Altabello. We called him Mr. because he was a teacher first. Yeah, he was my homeroom teacher actually. But years later. Ronnie was my coach, and I, I, I thank Ronnie all the time when I see him for what he taught me fundamentally from Johnny Altabello. But when I got to, to De La Salle, Johnny was the coach, Mr. Altabello was the coach. And uh, he was as, as good as they say he was. Uh, he was a tactician, and I felt like he was a better baseball strategist. And because, you played baseball as well. Yes, because baseball requires a lot more strategy than basketball. And Mr. Altabello would strategize on bunts, on suicide squeeze, on who to walk, who to pick off. who to. So he was great as a coach in baseball oh, yeah. and equally as, as good in basketball. That's interesting. He doesn't get that credit, uh, that credit but right. I, I remember he did coach both. Hey, now I have to talk about this. You played against Al Cinder, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, in college, but you happen to not only play with them in the pros, because you played against them in college, but you played with them in the pros for the Milwaukee Bucks. They ended up winning a championship in 1971. But what was it like? And did I hear that you might have room with him as well? <laughs> well, you, you've done your homework. Well, i got to get this story. I'm you've digging deep for this stuff. Well, yes, this is true. Um, two quick stories about the Bucks. Uh, when, when I first got there, they, that we ran a 300-yard dash, this is in training camp, and we ran a 15-minute run. So the object was to see how far you could run for 15 minutes and how fast you could run 300 yards. They did it in alphabetical order. So Alcindor Arthur were go. paired up in the first Alexander heat. Alexander would have ran between you In the you first guys. heat, <laughs> right. So uh, you probably, I don't think you would have run with us. But anyway, no. we, we run. Lou beats me by about a step. And I'm thinking that's pretty good. It turns out he had the fastest time of the whole team. I had the second fastest. And both of our times were faster than any Green Bay Packer ran that time. Wow. Back wow. then. Wow. And, and, and that's documented. And I remember it distinctly. Well, you guys had some long legs, but I didn't always look like this. So maybe I could have <laughs> run with you guys because I did run across country. Delta. There you go. We'll there see. You. But that's my favorite picture. All of I mean, Kareem, I had Carl Malone here last month, correct? Oh, okay. The only person in NBA history that has more points than Carl Malone is that man standing right there. His name was Lou Alcindor back then. He changed it to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a few years after that, right after that, actually. And, but that picture also has the great Oscar Robertson right in the middle, a former Buck as well, but he played for the Cincinnati Royals right. before that. So being on the floor with those guys, real quick, the experience. Well, it was fun. Incidentally, that's the only time I ever scored double figures. I had 13 in that game. Give me some doubt on that one, brother. And, All right. And, but and the, the irony of it is Lou only had 13. Right. And so that, that game may have been the lowest he ever scored. It was the highest I ever scored. Hey, you got to take it when you can get it, baby. But it was fun. It was a fun game, and I, I enjoyed it. You know what else is fun? You're going to take your significant other to this oh. little spot. It's called Shays Dallas Shays. Oh, been there. Well, you're going to go absolutely. there again on, on the Street. house. On hey, this is on Will, my producer. Primetime Sports, tell me we sent yeah, you. Absolutely. Enjoy it. I can't thank you. This has been an honor for me to have you. Mr. Authors. John Authors is his professional name, but his friends call him Johnny. I thank you so much. You're We're going to sign this basketball because you might have a little story about that oh, as we oh, go. Real quickly, I do have a story on the okay. autographs. Uh, we were coming out of Cobo Arena playing at the Pistons. Yeah. And I was walking down the tunnel, and a young fellow ran up to me, and he said, do you play for the Bucks, mister? Do you play for the Bucks? And I said, I sure did. He said, can you get me Lou Alcindor's autograph? <laughs> he didn't want anything to do with yours, huh? The end of the story hey. is Lou wouldn't sign it on the bus because it was a bus back to the hotel. But I signed Lou Alcindor right, right. on the program, gave it to the kid. He ran off as happy as can be. So somewhere in Detroit, there's a 55-year-old man with an autograph that's really not loose. That's really not. Well, <laughs> hey, to, to say something funny, I, we, I have a good friend, which a lot of my friends watching this show will know, that used to sign Shaq's name all the time to it. But I'll stop right there because it's the end of the show. And I got to thank everybody, Lion Jell and Chase Bricado. Of course, my man, Johnny Arthurs. And then, of course, my first guest, Jeffrey Marks. I can't thank him enough. The youngest Pulitzer Prize winner in the history of investigative journalism. That is quite a feat. It's been a great show. Like I said, next week, I can't wait. It's a draft show. We're going to have some great guests. Stay tuned for that right here on Primetime Sports. i got to thank Will Hill, Jace Move, 
Kitty Juno, the Redhead Tsunami, and everybody at CST and WLAE. I got to thank them all. Y'all have a great week.